is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott here with Andrew Young. Over the last few weeks, an interesting topic has emerged on this show, and we've had some really good conversations about it with some smart people. And the topic is decentralized physical infrastructure, or DPIN. The idea basically is that you can use a user-owned network, similar to DeFi and other areas of Web3, to marshal and harness uh, physical assets in the real world, whether those are internet hotspots or dash cams or CPUs or GPUs, you can get everybody pooling these assets together and working towards some common cause. And they would do that because as an owner, they're incentivized and they receive some compensation for it. Now, it's a very interesting topic that clearly has big economic ramifications. Uh, Masari, one of the leading research firms, estimates that the deep end market could grow to trillions of dollars in the next five to seven years. And it's no small wonder, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to take all of the excess capacity in the economy and to steer it towards something maybe more productive. And I find this a very, very interesting topic for a couple of reasons, because right now, blockchain and Web3 are emerging at a time when other technologies are similarly putting big demands on our resources, whether that's AI or extended reality. And so um, it's good to sort of understand how we can do this and what the challenges are to actually making it happen. And we're very fortunate today because we have two outstanding guests who are going to help to shine some light on the opportunity around decentralized physical infrastructure and specifically around um, rendering and around GPU usage. So uh, we'd like to welcome to the show Jules Erbach, who's the CEO of Otoy uh, and founder of the Render Network, and Trevor Harris Jones. He's the COO of Otoy, and he's also on the board of directors for the Render Network Foundation. We're going to learn a little bit more about the Render Network and how it applies to this very fascinating concept. But first, gentlemen, thank you and welcome to the show. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Okay, so I'll leave it to you to kick it off, but we just love to um, learn a little bit about the Render Network. Tell us about the origin story for um, for it and uh, and where we're at today. Thanks. Well, you know, it, 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 for, from my end, um, you know, my background's in graphics, um, and in particular, I've I've always you know I started Otoy uh, to build tools and democratize you know artists you know graphics capabilities, including doing CG on a GPU. I was you know one of the first people to do that, um, and way back in two thousand four, I realized you know regardless of how well that works. What's missing is something where if you're going to do, you know, large scale movies, I mean, there's only so much power and capacity you can put into a single computer. Um, and, I, and I always imagined that rendering in the cloud would be a, an important consideration. And, and, you know, I've been working on AI related stuff as well. I mean, the intersection of graphics and machine learning is, is obviously really obvious now. But, you know, the, the idea with the render network was, was something that um, I had all the way back in the mid 2000s, and as I developed Otoy, and our, you know, our software, Octane Render, is used for Marvel movies. It's used um, to render things on the MSG Sphere. It's being used currently to do a lot of work for the Apple classes. Uh, we're building an app. Others are, are, are doing the same. And you know, the, uh, the thesis behind Render was at some point, um, you know, the said get home model appealed to me, right? I mean, the ability of paying people's latent GPUs, a lot of millions, hundreds of millions of people have GPUs for video games. Um, now it's in, you know, you have high end GPUs in every single iPhone that are that are competitive with desktop GPUs of seven or eight years ago. Um, and as we productized uh, our software, we had customers, and they included you know, Marvel, like Marvel rendered Ant-Man the Wasp, the two-minute intro in 2018 on GPUs in the cloud. Um, but we were seeing that as uh, you know, VR was kicking off and as customers would push for more GPU capacity, we'd run out. I mean, we were using Amazon. Uh, Eric Schmidt joined our advisory board in 2013 to get Google's GPUs to be part of our system. And everybody, everybody was running out. There were maybe, you know, 10,000 GPUs available now. There's maybe in the, you know, you have in the hundreds of thousands. But, you know, when you have millions of artists and each one needs to do a, a render job that takes, you know, a, a couple of hundred or a thousand GPUs, it was something we almost had to shut down the service by mid-2016 because of the fact that there was, you know, it was actually at one of our partners, MSG, that was <laughs> six months of AWS rendering time 
for a deadline that was in three months was impossible. And that's when I realized, you know, I should, I should dust off the, um, uh, you know, the idea of the render network. Uh, and this was, you know, in, in 2017, there was a lot of excitement around Ethereum. A lot of people were having, you know, there were millions of GPUs out there in, in those days, uh, NVIDIA tiny TIs that were set up to mine Ethereum. And they weren't really making a ton of money, um, but we were spending top dollar on Amazon, Google, Azure, and others to supply these GPUs to artists. And you know the, the problem is, you know, sure you can get spot instance pricing; it's a tenth the price. But if you don't have the availability, you're always paying for the top dollar. So the render network was born out of the concept of just taking out. I had a patent in you know, that I filed in 2009 called uh, token-based billing for ray tracing for every ray that's used in a. Uh, CG operation or perceptron from you know neural rendering uh, it was something you could create a, a you know, an energy unit around and that's how the render token was born we um, put it on the Ethereum network in 2017 uh, it was in beta for a while and it slowly we phased out our centralized rendering on Amazon and had individual user GPUs be used for everything else and there was you know we we had within weeks we had triple or four times the capacity of all the GPUs on all three cloud providers. We have a wait list of about a million GPUs. And as the uh, jobs are scaling up and as of course now AI jobs are becoming even um, more of a, uh, you know, an intense you know, driver of demand, um, the, you know, the, sorry, okay, okay. the future of the, um, of the render network um, is definitely going to be fueled by a lot more interest in this. And what's interesting is that, you know, when we first launched the render network, I think the payout versus an Ethereum token was something like 50 X, even if we were doing it at one eighth the cost of AWS. So it's, it really was um, an early uh, way of, of leveraging, you know, something that we knew there was demand from because our own tools and our own partners and our own customers were, were driving that. And, uh, and in fact, the very first commercial job was done for, um, you know, for the uh, creative director of, of ILM. Uh, and it was, you know, something that he did to do something for the Hayden Planetarium. It had to be done the next day. We did it in 30 minutes. And he was our first customer. His name was John Knoll. He was also the creator of Photoshop. Um, and from there, we've had uh, most recently, or not some, most recently, the one uh, studio movie that I know was rendered on our network was the Star Trek remastered motion picture. Um, Paramount needed the capacity, and it was rendered on individual users' machines and then encrypted. And there you go. That was a major studio movie that was done, um, you know, in, in an anonymous way on the render network. And we only knew about it because of the support ticket, where we had to see what the project was, and that was that was pretty incredible. So. Uh, you know, yeah. now we're, you know, I'll, I'll pause there. I know that that's a lot of input, but that's sort of the story trajectory of how we got here. Well, I like, I like the story because it sort of fits into three, um, neat chapters, three acts, which, you know, as someone who's been helping artists, you know, a lot about the three act structure, but so act number one is, um, if you want to render something, you got to buy a really expensive computer. Um, yeah. act two is, well, no, actually what you really need is to harness um, a bunch of GPUs into a cloud and have people rent that out, right? And then that becomes uh, sort of like, you know, um, like any other cloud service provider, but focused on on rendering. And if you could get 100 GPUs working on the same problem all at the same time, then maybe you can do it for a fraction of the cost and, and in less time, right? And then act number three is, well, you know, now that we've got this explosion of, of GPU capacity in the world and all these people who, you know, are using it to make money, maybe we can find a way to make get them to make a little more money by pooling their GPUs. And then it's, in a way, it's kind of an extension of act two, right? It's like, well, we'll take the idea of a, of a sort of a centralized cloud and we'll decentralize it. We'll expand it to anybody and anybody can plug in. And so we can harness all of this capacity and uh, taken together, all of that capacity should rival um, the capability of a lot of centralized clouds, right? I think that's part of the narrative. Um, is that basically correct? That is actually really pretty much correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, and then, so then I'd love to just understand um, today, you know, Otoy is still around and it's still doing lots of work for creators, but are you seeing that some of the traditional customers or uh, maybe some new customers are choosing to use the decentralized cloud for the same kind of capability? Like how is that, what's the process like as an end customer, you know, using a service where they can call, you know, you up and and ask you questions versus I'm over simple <laughs> here versus like you know plugging into a decentralized network. Well, the, the thing is, we know artists really well, so Otoy doesn't actually 
Um, you know, we don't really have our own GPU data center, particularly. Uh, you know, that's where you know, the GPUs from Amazon and other cloud providers come in. But we do right. sell software like Adobe for Photoshop, right? You know, we, we give you a 3D render octane and, uh, you know, it's been out for 12 years and it does great. Uh, we, there are several other companies that do GPU renders, you know, Autodesk, one of our major investors, Maxon. And interestingly enough, both of those renderers now are on the render network, you know, we're, so we're bringing in others. And our goal is that, you know, we, we touch a lot of customers um, as do our, our, our partners. And, the, you know, the render network is just a pool of resources that a- any of us can sort of send our customers to. And in particular, you know, we've been in future now, I think the last five Apple keynotes, including the one that was just uh, in October 30th, you know, for Octane. And Apple has a really interesting hardware profile. They've decided to build their own GPUs. They don't, they no longer use Intel or NVIDIA or AMD. And you get one, even the Mac Pro only has one GPU and it's very good and it's very low power. But if you want to render something, you're going to send that right to the, to the cloud. Uh, and so what we have is sure, you know, you can access the render network as a web service. You can, there's an API, uh, companies like Swatchbook, which does, um, rendering for, you know, uh, shoes and other and, 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 uh, and clothing, right? And, and mass scale has uses that API, but a lot of customers just package their 3D file and send it to the render network. And Otoy makes a software that helps them create those 3D files and renders them locally. Uh, and we've also, and the render network itself had to exist apart from that, not just for supporting a decentralized system, um, as it does, but also so that we could create a larger organization that can handle um, companies that may even compete with Otoy. Uh, and so that's kind of where the, the difference between those things happen, but they're also, it's also complementary. Yeah, interesting. Hey, so, can, I, can I add to that, Jules? The, Jules, uh, yeah. what I love is, is when you chat to customers, they start with an urgent need. It's, it's most likely a job that needs to be done in a hurry. And um, that's how they get to know the render network. Um, and when they do, you see the light bulb go on. And it switches from um, this being a place where I, I could get a job done quickly to wait, I, I can earn uh, render for doing work. Um, and they they slowly over time move from turning their rigs into sort of part-time rigs they use to rigs that are always on the network because uh, you know, kind of like a battery, you earn up charge of, of render. And then when you have work you want to do, um, many of them don't actually even use their own rigs anymore. They use the power of the larger decentralized network and the render tokens they've earned in using it. So it's an amazing customer journey from just an initial discovery to, wow, this is um, a sustainable uh, usage for my my GPU. Well, the, yeah. that's so interesting. And I just wanted to add, ask one more question, Andrew, and then I know you want to jump yeah. in here, but um, all yeah. of the tooling like Octane can run on the render network, like all of the, the actual software that you have to help um, d- uh, artists to to create and to, to their very, to their specifications, to their files, that can also run on the decentralized cloud. Is that correct? Yep. We, yeah. So the reason why it worked so well from day one was that we have every single 3D tool, a lot of 2D tools, even you know Photoshop and After Effects from Adobe have plugins for Octane. We just built those like really early, really broadly. We had a whole you know Dell community that built uh, integrations for everything. Nobody else had that. Um, and so whenever you're, you're rendering with Octane in anything, could be in Unity or Unreal, could be in, in Blender, could be in, in you know any of these 3D tools, you can spit out an open source file, which we submitted to MPEG, and then now it's being um, you know, integrated with um, the Academy Software Foundation and others. It's, it's, it allows you to then just have Octane the renderer, just the raw renderer, and everything that was related to the 3D tool doesn't need to be there, and that can render on anyone's machine. Um, what we've done, and that is our closed source software. Now we can run open source renders, but the closed source software is, you know, and the renders are the most popular ones. So Autodesk Arnold, you know, render maps on Cinema 4D, which is a very popular 3D tool used by Deep and many others. Um, you know, Blender, uh, you know, is, is open source, but a lot of renders for it aren't. We license Maxon's um, engine, the 3D tool, and their render, Redshift, to put that on the render network. And we effectively created a plugin system where any any of these systems can run on these decentralized nodes and there's a royalty stream. So if you're running a Cinema 4D and Redshift job, which has nothing to do with any other toy software, um, you know, Maxon, the company that, that makes those two pieces of software, will get a piece of that render. And if there's a tax on top of the compute cost. So it's a system that, that um, while it's a bit early in this sense of like, obviously, I'd love to see 100 renders on there. Um, yeah, as it turns out, I mean, the market only has about you know six that are extremely popular, and um, and really you know only about three or four that are really good on the GPU. So uh, you know we're probably a, a good chunk of that market. So that's kind of where we see um, others besides us uh, leveraging the, the system. And there is an SDK 
uh, to develop that. And that SDK is going to be handled more and more by the foundation versus us at Otoy. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And that's it's really cool to see uh, using sort of this latent demand to drive lower costs for the end user. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, obviously, kind of like one of the, probably you guys get a lot of questions from potentially potential new users on uh, when you're using a decentralized sort of GPU network, rendering network, how, how are sort of, uh, how are these projects uh, secure and like how is privacy dealt with? Uh, just, I'm just kind of curious on how, uh, uh, I guess, how that works. So everything, as I mentioned, that I call that that Star Trek, uh, you know, movie from 2021, uh, the remastered Star Trek future, that is done on individual machines. Even we couldn't see that, right? Because we had no idea until there was a support ticket which allowed us to open up the, you know, the scene and see what the renders were. Um, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So effectively from the user's machine, when they're uploading the file, it's encrypted. It gets sent to a decentralized node where it's, it's de-encrypted in, you know, all the way to GPU memory, not in system memory, not stored on disk. And the data is rendered on the GPU and then sent back. Um, and it's scrambled even in GPU memory. So that's been enough for the last, uh, you know, I would say six years to handle commercial work. Um, if you send your, your, you know, your render to, you know, AWS or a lesser render farm, there's no guarantee necessarily those things are completely secure. AWS does have, um, you know, yeah, certification from the MPA. Um, we joined MESA, you know, which is an organization just to certify certain nodes for that. But you know, when, when you're seeing a lot of people looking for, I don't want to spend top dollar on AWS where there's not enough capacity, they will they will offer the security that we offer, and it's very good. Um, as far as privacy goes, again, you know, because it's end encrypted, it's like signal, you know, we don't really see what that traffic is. Um, but you know, that gives you a rough idea of how we've been handling you know privacy, especially for sensitive content, which a lot of the jobs on the render network are. Yeah, and one of the other things I thought was really interesting, I've actually never seen this from any other sort of crypto networks or um, was was you guys kind of use almost like a proof of reputation to secure the network in the sense that um, the it looks like the nodes on the network essentially uh, they build up trust as they as they do jobs and and it doesn't use kind of like a, a again correct me if I'm wrong it doesn't use sort of stake weighted uh, I guess balance for securing the network it looks like as you actually use the network more both as a customer and uh, on the supply side you earn more reputation which then allows you to essentially use the network more. Is that is that kind of correct? Yes, I would say that, that we have, you know, just by necessity and by for, for practical purposes, we do rate every node that, to a certain way, right? Is it reliable? Um, is there a trustworthiness aspect? And of course, if your node is online and you're powering electricity to wait for jobs, you want to make money. So there's an incentive there. And, you know, artists as well. I mean, if you're if you're abusing the network and you're doing tons of failed jobs and you're not necessarily, you know, that's rare, but it has happened. And so those users get, you know, sort of get the, um, you know, deprioritized, uh, you know, and so there is the prioritization, this, you know, the lifeblood of how the network works, that is um, or, or pretty organic, but also, you know, when you send a, a job and 1% of your frames fail, and you have to re-render them, which is how it works, right? So there, there's this fault tolerance. Um, it's a pain because your job may be done, but you're maybe even for the last few frames have to go out somewhere else. We don't, nobody wants that, right, for the, for the system. So if somebody is, Signing up through GPUs and the machine isn't reliable. Not even if they're untrustworthy, that goes into your 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 score as well to some degree. So that's something that is built in. Um, but then there's an even inter more interesting angle, which is um, a lot of people are using the render network, especially since 2021, for doing NFTs because everything that's rendered on the network has a hash for the 3D file, the textures, first time of upload. It's everything is provable. Um, so we have you know Koth and, you know, and people both doing their renders on the render network, and it's like an NFT is built in. I mean, you don't even need to go to and do anything special. The actual output has its receipt on chain, just like that Star Trek movie, all the frames for that. So there's a lot of interesting aspects there. Um, and again, nodes can sign up for different tiers, depending on how powerful they are, and depending on, like, if you want to have MTA certification, there is a node type for that. Uh, we can send you to MESA, and you can get that certification. And there's four or five or six different providers that, that have that currently not a ton, but more could be added. Uh, so yeah. That last yeah, there, point, there's, there's something like inherent. Actual, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to, yeah. to point something out, which is yeah. that like yeah. the idea that um, there's a hash of the actual information itself, like the the actual rendered visual for the NFT is is very compelling because one of the criticisms of the NFT space was that like there's a transaction hash which is on chain, but the actual like metadata and the, the information about the image or whatever it might be might might have been stored on AWS or something like that. And to me, it's yeah. one of those examples of like needing to decentralize the whole stack 
in order to, you know, give an owner of an asset, a digital good, they're willing to pay a lot of money for a, a sense of like true um, control, right? Uh, sovereignty. And I think that, that that's like a, a very compelling, one of the, one of the three big reasons why I think deep end is so important um, is the idea that, you know, if we're looking to, the web itself was intended to initially be a decentralized network, but if three quarters of all the data and all the computation is run by three companies, then it's actually, you know, decentralized in name only. And that's also true for a lot of web three applications who might have like a crypto front end, but the back end is not, right? So like, to me, that's a, that's a really compelling argument. Sorry, Trevor, you were going to say? I was going to say that the genius behind this reputation system is that the work being done is, is really atomic. You know, you have frames going out to individual nodes and um, the work comes back in a very binary fashion. Either it is the frame rendered and approved by the artist or it's not. Um, and, and so it's really built into the fabric of how the reputation system operates that the rendering job and the work being done um, is provable by the artist. And, and so, it, you know, you can build that trust layer through, um, you know, having someone physically approve the work being done on your device in, in a different way from many other uh, deep end networks. Yeah, very interesting. So I wanted to, um, well, so Jules, the last time that you and I spoke was, I think it was in January of this year. So January of 2023. And um, I remember one of the arguments that you made was, um, a lot of the GPUs that sit inside of data centers might be a couple of years old. And in the world of GPUs, that's enough to make them to, to make it so that like um, a GPU in someone's house, whether it's on their computer or it's a special device for, say, mining Ethereum or whatever, might actually be more performant than the GPUs that are sitting inside the data centers, which is interesting because, you know, there's an argument against this whole deep in space, which is, well, you're just going to harness a bunch of old computers that can't do anything or something like that, right? Um, yeah. So what's, what's the value in that? Now, um, I always found that to be a really compelling argument, especially vis-a-vis -vis GPUs, because it's true that gamers and other people are like always looking to keep the most cutting edge devices in their, in their lives. But then this year we saw um, NVIDIA release uh, like a new generation of data center specific GPUs, the H100, right? Um, and I'm not a chip expert, but I know that those specific chips are really super duper performant. And I know that a lot of data center, um, you know, owners, providers, whatever, are are turning over their their chips into into these new ones. And so I'm just wondering, like, does that argument still hold uh, that they're they're still at equal or near equal sort of performant sort of chips that are out there in the world that can be harnessed, or are are the data center chips actually kind of distancing themselves or separating themselves from from the rest of the pack? I mean, it's, it's a fantastic question. Um, and, you know, I have to divide that into two parts. So, so one part, the H100 and the A100 before that are not great at rendering. In fact, the A100 is like, you know, it's, it's a, you know, the, the latest chip from Apple on the uh, M3 is probably, you know, comparable in terms of performance to an A100, right? Which was one of the, um, it was a precursor to the current h 100 When you're training chat GPT four or five, um, yeah. And you need, you know, terabytes of mem memory and you need interconnects for that use case alone. And for things that are like that, large language models, sure, you know, having that for training is, is important. Uh, and that is not in, in the average user's machines. Here's the interesting part, though. If you're looking at, at, um, at training things for image generation, like stable diffusion or mid journey or runway ML, I mean, those kinds of things can be done at 24 gigs of memory and it's done in a single GPU uh, uh, or a couple even. And that's in a lot of people's machines. You know, like the 3090 or 4090 has 24 gigs. Um, there's 48 gig machines out there. Those those types of AI jobs absolutely can be run on the render network. And I think those are going to be massive. I mean, of course, you know, when you look at the single, you know, use case customers and the big companies that are doing training, you know, sure, those those H100s are, are, are scarce and there's a lot of money being made by NVIDIA. The data centers do have an advantage there, but I would say that you know the eighty percent of AI jobs that I that certainly are interesting for artists and graphic designers, separate from the you know, training step of LLMs, um, is totally doable on the GPUs on the render network, and inference is as well. I mean, you have large language models that can run, you know, frankly, on a you know on a laptop, and of course they can run on, on high end GPUs, and there's a ton of those. Like we have tons of thirty nineties and forty nineties 
on the network. And again, you know, one of the things that's, that it makes those GPUs in the data center unique is the amount of memory. So NVIDIA does sort of stop at 48 gigabytes for their desktop GPUs or things outside the data center. But one company does make GPUs that are a lot more memory and they're selling them by the millions and that is Apple. So the laptop the, uh, that they just announced October 30th has 128 gigs of memory. Um, you know, you could, you know, that's more than any GPU that I think NVIDIA makes. And the GPUs on those laptops are, are getting better and better. So it's a fascinating um, take. I would say that the GPUs that are that are out there in the wild are actually really good. And the only reason to, you know, go to the data center is for training massive data sets, which is not necessarily, you know, either the future or the current, you know, use case of visual generative AI, which or audio or media generative AI, which is something we're extremely focused on. Uh, and I think that there's also fine tuning. So if you do a massive training, right, you know, you don't need to do, you know, retrain traffic to every, you know, every three months, you can just do fine tuning, you can do partial training, and those things can be done on much uh, more modest amounts of GPU memory footprint. So all of those types of tasks um, are not only things that are doable on the network, but probably driving a huge amount of its growth going forward. Hmm. So there's the answer. <laughs> so that's, that's helpful. And also like, I think in inference and rendering, I mean, I, I like there are like foundational models that need to do a lot of training, I guess, but like, I, I think most of the business use cases are going to be um, outside of training versus inside of training. You know, like, I think like um, all the things you just described are things that, if they can run on all these other computers, then a decentralized cloud is the perfect way to address it. Because like right now, you know, within the chip industry, there um, might be uh, a demand for these training GPUs, which are not in ready supply or whatever, but that'll reach an equilibrium at some point. But in the long run, you need there. I, I think that there will always be pressure on the market to deliver the compute needed for all of this, this explosion of, experimentation and creativity that I think AI has, has enabled, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And the other thing too, is that, you know, yeah, like the newest Apple computer will be like more powerful than, than any computer that ever existed before, you know, five years ago or something. <laughs> um, and it, well, it, has, it has more memory than anything on, you know, individual GPUs in the data center, I think top out at 80. And the new, yeah. new Mac, MacBook Pro, you know, the laptop has 128 gigs. It's, it's wild. Um, and for training, and if you're doing 4K generative renders, like we also have a part of our business at Otoy is digital doubles, right? We've been doing that for 14 years. We can, you know, we now have synthetic pipelines for de-aging, for makeup, um, for, for all of that. When you say digital double, does that just say the same as a digital twin? Yes, but for people. So in yeah, other words, when you, you know, when, when you know, tragically Paul Walker passed away in Fast and Furious 7, we had a light gauge scan that was used by the digital effects company. It was a perfect graduate scan of his face. We bet every single Marvel movie, every single actor practically in Hollywood has been scanned in our you know, facilities. And there's a 3D model of all their expressions. And it used to take a huge team of artists to animate that and make that look good. And with machine learning, honestly, certainly if the performer is still there, you can you can recreate that really easily. And it makes it a lot simpler. So that's an example of, um, of where these things go. And, and to train that and to do all that work doesn't require H100s. Um, you know, we used to do that on four A A100s, but that also can be, you know, concatenated down to a single uh, GPU, especially, um, you know, the ones Apple's putting out there, the training can be really interesting, the 128 gigs. And there's a lot of A100s out there, much more than H100s. So thinking through all these different, you know, use cases. Uh, and I also think training costs will just go way down. I mean, we're not necessarily doing it right that throwing this kinds of massive data efforts. I mean, we're just at the very beginnings of figuring out how to optimize for that. Um, what I love about the open source models sort of competing against the chat GPTs of the world is that there's a lot of innovation. I think when Zuckerberg put out one well, of I think he was hoping that people might be able to optimize that. Everyone could learn from that, he could, right? So there's, there's I, I see that trend sort of continuing, but I also just see, you know, just consumer GPU just having enough memory to actually be useful for training and for the, so a lot of that training to be doable on an individual node. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think one thing I really wanted to sort of touch in because we, we talked a little bit about the sort of integration with with NFT market. Um, we're obviously a DeFi podcast, uh, and I was kind of thinking with are render, we? The render, <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> I mean, we our, name that's, only. Our, <laughs> that's our that's our name, yeah. But I mean, it was interesting because I was thinking like the render token effectively in a way is almost like a tokenized uh, like represents like tokenized compute or render compute, um, uh, which is really interesting. And it was kind of making me think like, is there, there's some probably some pretty interesting integrations with DeFi in the sense that, um, 
if you wanted to, if you're like a, someone that, you know, thinks you're going to be a big consumer of a uh, future render, then in, in some ways you could almost have like futures markets uh, around this type of, it's almost like a whole new asset class in a way, um, or like a, a, almost like a new type of commodity. Um, I'm just kind of curious if you guys have, uh, or just like if there's sort of, uh, you know, stakeholders or, or developers in the ecosystem who've been sort of playing around with this, with this idea of, uh, of render as like a new asset class. Leave it to you, Andrew, to, to take this concept and turn it into a financial <laughs> engineering discussion. <laughs> Like how do we? My next guy, he loves it. Rendering <laughs> you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a great question. I'm curious. Yeah. Well, sure, Randall, if you want to sort of take that one on and and, and trigger yeah, thoughts yeah, on sure. that. So yeah, so um, nobody yet, but uh, I mean, a, a big part of the original thesis around the network was was really around provenance, and um, being able to do more um, with on-chain data than is currently done, and and so when we were designing it, we we were looking at potential royalty streams. Being able to, um, you know, assign complicated um, calculations um, with various prompts and, and other inputs on whatever was created, um, and uh, you, you know, we honestly um, are thrilled that our, our move to Solana um, really for us is a key point in this because we we needed a, a higher throughput chain for us to be able to start doing more and more on chain, and we we look at that and the ability through. Merkle trees to to put compressed NFTs on chain, and we go, wow! There's going to be a point pretty soon where a lot of very cool data is available and publicly on chain, and and I think that's the point the um, DeFi type person will step in and say, okay, you can build an amazing model on top of this on um, perhaps in investing in um, how it's produced or, or or purchasing it or sharing in the um, royalties associated with it as it grows and, and as it uh, evolves as as a a living piece of, of, of created art. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to add, yeah. And to add on that, I mean, I, I did sort of come up with a system back um, when Render was launched. It was almost, you know, it was called the M, an M token, right? Which is a metaverse token so that you could take your render and you could kind of feed that into, you know, we're, we are doing, you know, like Vestor and Jack did a Star Trek investor in Otoy and we were doing the Ron and Barry archive, which was going to 800 hours of Star Trek production history, the you know, 60 year history, and you know, rendering those things on chain. In fact, we, we've been doing that for, for a while. And Apple's keynotes actually show the work. Um, what's fascinating is that it's, it takes a lot to render even the Star Trek Enterprise bridge for something like the Vision Pro. It's like a $30,000 render job or something crazy like that as volume. So the question is you know, there's a lot of power in both the concept of having ownership or investment in how much of the metaverse, what do you want to see the render network actually do? If there's a scarcity of compute power, if you can't render everything at the same level, you tell what's most popular. It's almost like, you know, if you funded TV show or, or tickets drive sort of the, you know, where cinema goes, right? I mean, there's something along those lines in here as well. And also, you know, I just look at the incredible explosion of things like on phantom.com, which came out of Jim Wells' Wikipedia, where, you know, you have 300,000 articles on Star Wars on, on Wikipedia or, you know, 100,000 between memory alpha and memory data on Star Trek. And this kind of user-generated love for these um, these fandoms, you paired that with the graphics uh, capabilities and the work that's really being done, not just by us, but others. There's something for sure there. And I also see media being generated. You know, you have Vanity Fair, that's a consumer-facing thing that is absolutely not a 4K render, right? Um, you have the Apple Vision Pro, which is I mean, maybe it'll have 400,000 units in year one. In, in year 10, if they're not if them to contact lenses by then, um, there'll be hundreds of millions. And that's also, however you experience AI, however you experience rendering, it'll probably be spatial. Uh, and I think there are, you know, the way, that, the rules of the game for how you look at media, how certainly how actors and IP is used, all those things intersect with what we're doing. And I've had that vision from the start for the render network to, to provide at least a rules-based system for how that can work. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty fascinating. Um, I mean, it's it's crazy that you sort of had this vision from from uh, back back then and just been kind of building towards it. Um, I, I one last question I did want to sort of touch on because um, we we talk a lot about it on this podcast uh, about like you know the different blockchains that people can build on. Yeah. Uh, we sort of think about it in, in three eras of smart contract chains. So Ethereum mm -hmm. sort of era number one, all about security. Uh, and then yeah. Solana and, uh, you know, all the different L2s that have kind of come around are sort of the second era focused on scalability. Um, yeah. And then the sort of third era that we're starting to see more and more projects do is uh, sort of application specific chains. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, I guess, it, if that's something that, 
you guys could see sort of render network becoming in the future? Like, is it, uh, does it make sense to stay on Solana forever? Or do you, could you sort of envision one day becoming uh, your own sort of, I guess, application specific chain? Um, yeah. or, or maybe just expanding to other L1s? Uh, yeah, just kind of curious. Yeah. I, I can start on that and Jules can sort of uh, show her head. But um, I mean, for us, it, it's kind of what the community tells us, right? So um, it, it was a community vote that that led to um, us moving from Ethereum to Solana. Um, and and uh, there was a lot of debate about whether we should run our own chain at that point. Um, it takes a, a fair amount of resources and expertise um, beyond what we had available at the time. So I think rightly so, the community said, hey, you should probably do this on um, Solana, uh, you know that that could well change in the future. Although, um, you know, given we've just moved over, it's not something we're really currently chasing or or, or considering. Um, but I, I could see it, you know, potentially in in the future. Um, you, you know, what's interesting though is also our, our approach is not single chain. Um, you, you know, we we are yes using um, Solana now for our, our core uh, rendering, um, but when we look at um, what is essentially published and produced, you know, you know your output. Um, we would love to see that expanded to produce NFTs on on multiple chains. You know, we we already today have artists who create um, NFTs across Ethereum, Solana, and, and other chains. So there's no reason why you, we can't have our output really um, pushed across a, a range of, of different infrastructure and, and chains to provide what what we view a, a real multi-chain type experience. Yeah. And and to that point, you know, the, the entire uh, system of proof of render, which is, you know, somebody wants, a human wants a job done and they have to prove it or not, then the receipt goes on chain, all the hashes are there. That exists before even Ethereum. I mean, we were doing these on AWS. I used the same system. It was always hashed. It was always mathematically in a ledger that can't be tampered with because we just rehash the chain. So all that data goes back to 2014. And I think that the idea was that, well, we started with Ethereum, we moved to Solana, um, but the render ledger is it, weirdly enough. I mean, it keeps it keeps growing. It exists sort of outside of any particular chain. Other chains can interact with it. Um, the output of that, of course, you know, we've stored those receipts on Polygon, Ethereum, now Solana. Um, but hashes of hashes are pretty easy to to verify. Um, and I do think that there's probably cases where, you know, you might want to do something with a different chain that can interact with this data. I mean, as Trevor's saying, I mean, we use Solana now for the for the top level, of, you know, effectively receipts of all the different transactions on there, but the data in there is way deeper than that. Um, so if you wanted to, let's say, use it for, you know, you want to pay at royalties and you know, do some training on data and if all of that is attributed and pay at a royalty stream, I still think Solana is great for that. But the idea of building things that could create new data on that chain still is something that could be done within the proof of render system, which is an SDK the foundation's building that is a chain independent. So I think multi-chain is relevant, but I could see people exploring this and taking this further over time, but we're not locked to any one system. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. Um, as a, to to borrow Andrew's uh, phrase, makes a ton of sense. Makes a ton of sense. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, very interesting, guys. So, um, like, I don't know. We like to ask people, "What's next?" You, you've kind of painted this picture of um, a brave new world, maybe, where in in a positive way, obviously, where you know there's a the explosion of creativity and people all need rendering capability and there's an insufficient amount of it in traditional vendors and so there's going to be huge demand for decentralized networks to make this happen and you know maybe the early adopters are web3 creators because they're accustomed to this toolkit but eventually it'll be everyone so what does what does it look like in five years like is the next um event <laughs> movie or whatever going to be entirely rendered on the render network um like tell us tell us the blue sky for this I, I certainly think there's a decent chance that, you know, I, and I'll start with something that is kind of, you know, an easy path to follow, which is Apple, when they enter a market, it's a big deal, right? You know, they, you know, 10 years ago, I was working with John Carmack at Oculus and they were you know, bought by Facebook doing VR stuff. That's, you know, we were doing VR renders in the cloud. That's why AWS is needed right then and there. Um, you know, and it, it didn't quite take off. There's 10 million of those VR devices. I think Apple's bet on spatial, don't call it VR, don't call it mixed reality. It just means that you're going to move to a different type of screen. Um, that I think is a precursor for a number of things. It's going to change the way, you know, and Apple's goal, I don't think is to have this thing be this pair of goggles. It's to go to glasses, contact lenses, things that are as transparent as, you know, the watch, something really easy to wear. And you have to look at that future as inevitably coming in the next five to 15 years, maybe one way or another, the operating system for this by Apple is there. There's an app store, it runs all iPhone and iPad apps. And the content for that is going to be generated differently 
um, then now you may still want to have a movie that's framed and, and done that way. But it's like, you know, when you looked at, at 3D films, you looked at Avatar, looked at different things, there's probably a much simpler way of telling stories and making movies that will be designed for those types of classes, right? Those kinds of spatial experiences. And there's even a step beyond that. We're partnered and we've invested in something called Light Kill Lab. It's making 100 inch TVs that are holographic that will have at least, you know, if you, if you want to have those volumetric experiences, you don't even need to wear anything for those. Those are also coming this decade. And for artists and creators, you know, the ability to even create with the Apple glasses is pretty amazing, uh, and as well as viewing those. Um, I think that there's going to be an explosion of spatial media uh, that will go from user, across from user generated content to artists that we've you know, you've seen when, when NFTs were, were working well, and we had thousands of artists using our software to make beautiful pieces of work. I think, you know, there was, in one year, it was like $800 million worth of NFTs were created with our tools. And those were nice, beautiful pieces of artwork. They weren't sort of the, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, low tier NFTs that I think, you know, kind of poisoned a lot of people's, um, you know, interpretation of, of that work. Um, I also think AI is just inevitably going to be, it's going to change everything, not just on the, on the low end where everybody can now create a, a movie. There's going to be skills that are learned and there already are because we use AI all the time as well as in Octane since 2017 to denoise your final renders. That'll be a superpower that'll enable you to really take an idea and generate something beautiful. You'll still have to have a skill of assembling it all together, but it's going to make creating content a lot cheaper, creating good content a lot better. And the distribution of these things, I mean, you look at, at the sort of how streaming ex both exploded, but also locked people into the, these formulas. I'm hoping that, you know, that's not just the Apple Glasses, I think the ability to generate content and have that viewed in a way that's, you know, beautiful and, and, and immersive, uh, which is what cinema is kind of meant to be to begin with, I think that's going to be our future by the end of this decade. Uh, and I also think that we're going to have to um, provide the tools to separate the people that are genuinely creating art with AI and rendering combined from the nonsense that I think also, you know, if you look at the nonsense that was done with NFTs, that also hurt true artists that were trying to create that kind of work. Uh, and then lastly, I would say the metaverse, um, you know, as envisioned more by Neil Stevenson than, than Mark Zuckerberg, probably will happen. I mean, I don't think Apple will ever use that word, but I mean, you know, spatial computing for them is is what they're calling it. And, you know, having played with the operating system on the classes, I mean, it's it's impressive. Um, they're a multi-trillion dollar company. NVIDIA has ambitions to do that on the cloud as well and others too. So I think that's that future for creators, for consumers, um, for experiences is really important. And I think in the 2030s, you're gonna see that go even further. And who knows, with LLMs and AI, you're gonna have you know, you're going to have you know, experiences where you can give anything sort of, and it's not a, so much a soul, but at least a digital brain that can that interact with the video games will be totally different. Um, helpers and, and, and the way you get information will be radically changed. And render is there to be sort of the, the spine, the oil, the fuel for these things, and also to provide on ramps and off ramps for publishing, for content, and for creation. Wow. Okay. I asked you delivered. I appreciate that answer. Um, it's, a, it's a bold vision. Um, we wish you the best of luck. We'll be right there with you following along the progress and hope to have you guys back on the show. Um, until next time, though, that's it for today's episode of DeFi Decoded. I'd like to thank uh, Jules and Trevor for joining us and for an amazing and uh, eye-opening conversation. I think we're going to have to dig deeper onto this subject, Andrew, on future episodes. But that's it for today. We will see everybody next week. Take care. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.